So good morning, everyone. Um, as Mary mentioned, my name is Aura Najmi. Um, with me, I have Ming today, and we will be talking about um, just the secure software, software supply chain and our product called Supply Chain Levels of Software Artifacts Salsa. So this is an open source product that anyone can kind of go in, use right now. It's a framework that we use to kind of um, understand the different aspects of what makes uh, supply chain software supply chain a little bit more secure. So just as an overview of today, uh, we'll be first going through uh, some of the different software supply chain challenges that exist today. We'll then get into the Salsa standard and exactly what it is. There's different levels and uh, different requirements for each level. Um, and then last, we'll go into some of the code samples that you can use to test artifacts within your supply chain and then end with a demo to kind of tie it together and show you what that looks like. So before we begin, I would love to know kind of where everyone is at. What is your role? What area of security um, you kind of operate within? So if you have used, if you've never used Menti before, if you can bring out your phone, go to menti.com, and there's a code up there. It's an eight-digit code, uh, 41691573, um, and just type in, answer questions, things like that. We'll be doing a lot of different questions throughout the presentation and workshop today. Um, and you know, some are multiple choice, some are open-ended, but uh, depending on your responses, uh, we might, may also have some swag that is available. Let's, let's keep it fun. So this is a Google thing. There will be some swag for the winners. <laughs> I'll, I'll send it out. I'll, so we, we will try to do that and participate. So uh, happy to have all the conversations and questions uh, in this. So we have So here are some of the answers that you guys are adding on. Cybersecurity SME, Cybershop Supervisor, Software Engineer. Uh, we have people in testing, knowledge system engineer. So pretty wide variety of, of skills represented here. Great. So before we actually get into the Salsa standard, it's really important um, to kind of first talk a little bit about the different challenges that exist within the software supply chain today. Um, there are so many different areas when we're actually building software that um, is important to check before deploying any of these builds. And so uh, the Salsa standard actually covers many of those areas. Software today is built to be very modular. So we have developers you know, that break down complex software systems into smaller, uh, much self-contained systems and components. And all of these are tested independently. Uh, many, many times they're added very independent of each other. Um, and they don't necessarily create or combine to create some complete application. Uh, they are very independent. There's also this aspect of plug and play. You have all of these different you know, Lego pieces of different colors, of different shapes, of different expertise, uh, many of them being open source, many of them being open libraries that are combined together to create this full product where testing is not as uniform, testing is not as consistent, especially when the teams are huge. Uh, so that also adds complexity into this entire secu secure software supply chain problem. And then lastly, there's this aspect of rapid prototyping. So we want to get software into the market as fast as possible. We want to make sure we're, we're building fast and we're actually deploying fast and uh, submitting these changes as fast as possible. So all of these different things add a lot of comp complexity into the supply chain. And if it's not being checked, it can also incur a lot of different challenges that software engineers and security professionals then have to deal with on uh, later. So with that, nested libraries, um, you know, uh, things like productivity, things like bringing uh, 
software at a time to market adds vulnerabilities actually into the market. You have things like versioning issues where you know different versions of, of different software builds get submitted and without keeping track of certain things, um, you have all of these vulnerable, vulnerable libraries that you know one person might submit while another software engineer might not necessarily be tracking. Um, all of these can lead to uh, deeply buried um, vulnerable libraries that are not necessarily as easily capturable by individual software engineers. And if you kind of think about it in scale, um, some of the cloud companies, right, some of larger technology companies, they have multiple teams across different product groups that are actually building these huge software products. And so how do you support all of those products when you have different groups of engineers actually building independent products in their, within their team? How do you keep things as uniform? How do you do things like cover all of the increased surface attack surfaces to make sure you're accounting for all of the different builds that are being pushed through at a single time? And so that's where this entire aspect of the software supply chain comes in. So you have from inception to the, the time when, you know, the code is actually run or the software is actually deployed, um, you have different aspects of what we consider the software supply chain. Most modern software products are typically made of source code, um, and then your you know, organization directly writes that. We integrate third-party software or any sort of dependencies into that, and then we actually create a build process that combines all of these different sources uh, and outputs this package software that's supposed to be very secure, that's supposed to you know, kind of operate according to your organization's uh, policies, um, and create the supply chain that you know, constitutes uh, can be a supplier, can be a consumer, that then is going to be assumed and used by other software companies or other product companies. So in the entire kind of scheme of things, you could be a consumer of these different aspects of the supply chain, or you could be a supplier of these different aspects of the supply chain. And both can pose a huge risk when you're actually considering supply chain security. And so here you can kind of just see all of these different dependencies are multiple considerations that go into when you're building uh, different products. Um, and supply chain uh, attacks are on the rise. So we've seen this in the last two years, um, you know, even more. The Salsa framework was actually created in 2021, but it's been something that's being built in-house at Google for a very long time. Um, but increasingly, when you consider the software development lifecycle um, and all of the different vectors that are included for attacks with a lot of things becoming more open sourced, uh, there is a huge increase. And you know, Gartner even estimates about, in a, a, like according to 2025, there will be a massive increase in specifically software uh, supply chain attacks. So you can see this could be from commercial or open you know, source framework vulnerabilities. This could be from different organizations that people actually use to you know, write code or build code or deploy code with people moving to the cloud for any of those tools that you kind of use across that different supply chain services. Um, all of these are attack vectors that increase that surface area for different attacks. And so what exactly does that look like? There's many different attack vectors that um, people you know, consider. And if we look historically at the different types of attacks that happen within supply chain, um, uh, software supply chain attacks, um, these are kind of the main areas within source and build integrity where you know, we've kind of identified where code or build processes are most vulnerable. So the first where you, know, you kind of see submit bad code, um, an example of that might be with limit Linux hypocrite commits where researchers attempted to um, intentionally introduce vulnerabilities into the Linux kernel uh, via patches or mailing lists. The second might be compromising source control platforms. So we saw this with PHP where attackers compromised PHP's self-hosted Git servers and injected two malicious commits. The third is um, within build and official processes, but from code that doesn't necessarily actually match that source control. So here, you know, the web admin attack where the attacker actually modified and built infrastructure to use source files not matching that original source, source control. Uh, number four, compromising actually the build control. So you'll see this actually moves over to the build portion of it. So the CI CD pipelines where we saw a SolarWinds attack. So this was probably the most uh, recognizable and most identifiable attack where the attacker compromised the actual build platform and installed an implant that injected malicious behavior throughout each build. The build is kind of the source for everything that's used you know, across the entire software pipeline. And so that was huge because 
then other companies like Microsoft came in and actually utilized that within their Office 365, and it kind of expanded from there. Uh, number five, using bad dependencies. So especially when you're building codes with different parts or different Lego components, um, you know, you, an example would be event stream where the attacker added an innocuous dependency and then uh, updated the dependency to add more malicious behavior into the actual distribution and did not match the code submitted into GitHub. Number six, when you upload a, upload an artifact that was not built by the actual CI CD pipeline. pipeline. Um, so this is an example of CodeGov, which was another really big attack where the attacker used leaked credentials to upload a malicious artifact to a Google Cloud storage bucket from which users actually downloaded directly. Um, and then compromising pro, uh, package repository. So this is the direct attacks on package mirrors where researchers ran mirrors for several popular package repositories, which could have been used to serve malicious packages. And then the last piece, once all of that is actually built, is where the use comes in. So this is where you're tricking those end user consumers. People say that you know end users or people are, are kind of the, um, the weakest link. But if you don't build secure soft software pipelines, and if you don't test the software's pipeline across the entire build, your users have absolutely no option but to be tricked by things like browser fight, uh, typo squatting, which you know, you're uploading all of these malicious packages uh, with similar names, um, and users are identifying them as the original package and then downloading them. So across this entire build, there's multiple areas where attack vectors uh, can be targeted um, and where things can actually go bad or be vulnerable. And so as uh, organizations, as security professionals, it's very important to be able to kind of manage that across the, across the entire uh, software supply chain. But how do you actually do that when there are so many different moving parts? One engineer might be responsible for one piece of it, while another engineer might be responsible for the distribution or CID pipeline piece of it. So combining all of these things, making sure that you know across the entire board, you're accounting for changes, minute changes that might happen across the build. You're accounting for any anything that other engineers might actually be implementing or bringing into the software. You're accounting for any technological innovation that your company or your organization wants to inherently build into the software that you're building for your organization. All of these things are, are huge considerations and uh, a big reason why the Salsa framework was created. So I'm gonna stop there. Um, we're gonna do a, another uh, kind of quiz here. So um, if you'll open up menti.com again and using the same code, in a software supply chain, what do you think is the most vulnerable attack vector? So I talked through a couple of the different attack vectors that we had um, in the previous slide, but you know, even in your own experience, if there are areas where you've seen different attack vectors kind of pop up, we have a couple of responses. So in a software supply chain, what do you think is the most vulnerable attack vector? So it could be in packages. So these are actually packages that you submit throughout the build. Um, users. So as soon as you know packages are deployed, if things are vulnerable, your users can easily kind of get confused or tricked. Uh, the code itself, which is, is huge because if the code throughout all of the dependencies has any sort of vulnerability in it, it can be can kind of uh, snowball into a much larger problem later on when the code is actually built. Um, source corruption, uh, bad dependencies, and then we have another one with code. So all of these are great examples, um, and all of these are huge considerations. So when you actually go through the Salsa framework and you go through other um, supply chain type products that evaluate, these are all things that are considered um, when we are looking at the code and the dependencies themselves. So where and how can things actually go wrong? So uh, very similar to some of the responses in the, in the previous quiz question, um, right? When you're actually looking at the supply chain, you have all of these different attack vectors, you have all of these different open areas where uh, people can inject bad code or do bad things. Um, but across the entire chain, there's multiple areas where things can go wrong. And one thing going wrong in a single place can snowball into this massive you know, vulnerable software that then is distributed to all of your users. So here's some scenarios where things like that happen. So if you have a vulnerable package and you, know, you have everything else correct, meaning you have clean source code, you have clean development pipeline, you have legitimate channels that are actually being used um, that lead to um, vulnerable software, you will still end up with a product that you know, will be at risk for your users and for your company. The same with if you have vulnerable packages and malicious updates. Uh, the same with if you have everything right but you have vulnerable source code 
And then if you have breached deployment pipelines and you have malicious updates, those can also lead to vulnerable software. So this, this graphic is you know, kind of explaining this, this major theme um, in the secure software supply chain, where it becomes very complex and it's very tricky because there are so many different areas where things can actually go wrong. Uh, you can have everything that's right, and your team can be completely in accordance with all of the different security policies. But unless all aspects of the secure or the supply chain, the software supply chain, are taken account of and are tested and verified at every step, things can still go wrong. And so that's really what we are going to focus on today: is how can you get to that point where you are not going to end up with any sort of vulnerable software? You can account for every step of the way and kind of get that um, verification and, and that attestation that things. Are are going to kind of end well. And these are, there's a couple of different challenges and major contributing factors that kind of lead to, to that. So uh, there's this, there's been this huge shift in using open source frameworks. So nearly all commercial code bases rely on some form or source of open source code or dependency. Um, and that is true for Google as well. We're one of you know, the largest open source. We believe in open source. And so a lot of our products are built with things that are using multiple dependencies. Uh, these can often introduce unknown contributors and expand within that supply chain. So very similar to what we saw, right? One small thing can, can snowball into something much larger. We also have this pattern of increasing pace of deployments. And so uh, modern development increases in deployment frequency, more and more products. As one software product is released, you have multiple sources and multiple updates um, and multiple feature sets that are released. And as more features are released, you need to update them too and then release them as well. So there's these uh, concurrent and parallel pipelines that are happening consistently kind of across that board. And there's a lack of security automation. Um, as customer engineers, we often see you know, this kind of at the forefront, where uh, most of our conversations revolve around security and what currently exists, and how people can actually uh, automate some of these things. We don't often see automation as an option because security professionals want to do some of those tasks themselves and actually manage you know, many of the policy themselves. And that is true. Security professionals should be managing the policies and, and mo the more min minute details of those uh, security profiles. But when it comes to actually doing some of the checking across all of these different uh, code pipelines, that is something that can be automated. And there are many tools that are available today for you to actually accomplish that. And then there are many attack ve vectors. So as code becomes a lot more complex, more and more attack vectors are kind of opening up opening up, and they're much more difficult to protect overall. And then different types of standards and tools. So the number and pace of emerging standards that you know, people have to kind of abide by um, uh, is increasingly growing. And so it does create this very complex problem for security professionals to keep that into consideration. So with that being said, um, this kind of introduces what uh, we call is the SALSA standard. And the SALSA standard is a security framework, so it's essentially a checklist of different standards and controls that help uh, users that help security professionals prevent tampering, they improve that integrity, and then improve um, and verify secure packages and infrastructure in your projects. It's composed of four different levels. Um, five if you consider level zero, but that just assumes that you're not really making any changes and you're not meeting any of the requirements. Um, Salsa was actually released in two, July 2021, um, and it was done by Google's security, internal security team for a lot of our own internal processes. So um, it was uh, supposed to be a framework that was inspired by Google's binary authorization for Borg. And what that essentially means is that we have massive amounts of data, we have massive, massive amounts of products that are released constantly to the market. And these you know, compose of many different types of builds that are released. How can you protect that data? How do you protect all of the different builds that compose those software supply chains? Um, and so this was created in-house and um, it went through many iterations and we actually opened it up for open source. Uh, it essentially ensures that all of the code and configurations are going to meet at least a minimum standard requirements um, and are going to be consistent and uniform across the board. And so as a user, you can kind of go through all of these different levels, follow what the requirements are, use the tools that are, exist within each and every level, and then check and verify to make sure that you know, your software, your supply chain is secure at level four. Um, incrementally, these actually grow incremental, incrementally, so one builds on top of it, another. If you beat level one and then you move to level two um, and that is okay for you, then you've met level two certification and you're kind of good to go. 
Um, self, salsa does offer a very common vocabulary to actually talk about many of the different incoming supply chain, uh, trustworthiness, and artifact challenges that exist today. So prior to this, prior to this framework, right, there was no standard way of re really evaluating everything. People either wanted to automate, people either wanted to do things themselves, but there was no uniform way of kind of looking at everything. Um, it also offers a way to secure your in incoming supply chain by looking at uh, a, just an actionable checklist. So you can go through this checklist, um, go through and actually verify, check, verify, check, verify, check, and make sure you're kind of good to go when you hit level four. And then it also allows you a way to measure all of the efforts are actually compliant with what your organization policies look like. So when you do have multiple teams kind of working across different projects, it adds that uniformity, it adds that conformity. And so this is kind of what the Salsa framework looks like. You have your level one, your level zero, which protects against nothing because you haven't really done anything and this is assuming, you know, you're kind of st starting at point zero. You have level one that does protection against um, not much, but it's you kind of getting started. So level one is more about documentation. You have all of the things built to kind of walk anyone who might be coming or looking at the processes about how your code is built, what that build process looks like, what kind of files you're actually developing. Um, and you do that through scripted build, and you do that with something called provenance, which is a metadata file that essentially walks through your entire build, when, you know, what kind of code you have, when you want to deploy it, things like that. Uh, level two is uh, usually it protects against any tampering after the build. So it's one step above. You have all of the documentation. And now you actually have a build service and sign providence to make sure that anything um, that you built afterwards is actually not going to be tampered with. Then you have level three, which goes into uh, during or after the build. You have that documentation, um, and now you're actually hardening the build service to make sure there's no there's going to be no changes that as you actually build out that software. And then level four is kind of the highest you can go in Salsa version one, which is tampering before, during, or after the build. This actually requires that man in the loop. Um, this actually requires a two-person verification. And it actually requires for uh, you to go out and prove hermetic builds, which essentially is that does your software, does your build code actually do what it says it does? And there's a series of, of steps that you can take to kind of ensure that. But level four is the highest, and level four ensures that you are kind of at the highest, um, or highest area of security you can kind of be at. So um, this is kind of the different areas where Salsa can help. Um, and you'll see it's very small there, but each level is going to target different things. And as you're kind of going through the checklist, um, you'll be able to go through and just see. These are all going to target different areas of the actual supply chain. So from source to build to provenance all the way to actual when the software actually uses the user. Um, but the Salsa framework, in a nutshell, essentially defines what does good look like. Good might look like different things to different people, to different organizations. And so if you decide Salsa level three is great for you, you know, that is what good is going to look like for you. It also provides a framework for assessing existing software development lifecycle. Um, it provides a framework for continuous improvement. So as you build and add more features into your pipeline, and as you build more and then you add more features into the pipeline, you're able to develop these processes that are going to learn from each other. Um, you understand what good looks like and then you try to get better. Um, it also shifts security to the left. So um, a lot of organizations want to be built you know, security by design, um, where you're not really thinking about security as an afterthought. So even before you actually start building some of these products, it's really important to consider some of these different um, elements in the framework to you know, start off um, so that you can build products that are going to be security by design. A lot of people call this zero trust security today, uh, but that's exactly what it is. Zero trust security means least privilege access, right? And so when you're building from ground up and you're building from a framework that's vouched for and that has all of the tests done for it, you're essentially building with zero trust architecture. Um, it also is going to en enable end-to-end -end supply chain trust. So from the moment you start all the way to the moment, um, you know, it actually ends up in the hands of the user. All of those steps are going to be verified. They're going to be tested by an admin. It's going to have documentation to actually prove that out. And then lastly, it's going to enable software development observability. So throughout that entire process, you'll actually be able to go in at any point and understand exactly where you are, what you're building. And so um, exactly what I said, right? Zero trust security, if you kind of look at how 
uh, zero trust bleeds throughout different um, infrastructures, it starts uh, very small at the actual infrastructure part, and then it bleeds up. Uh, it goes into the different workloads that you build on top of applications. It's embedded into the access control policies that you actually import into uh, the data that you allow your users to access. And then network access, identity and access management, things like that that you actually provide to your end users. All of these are different managed services that you can actually account for through the Salsa framework and that are considerations that you um, should be able to look at when you're looking at the um, salsa framework from level zero to level one. But there are a couple of limitations. So with salsa, mainly the limitations are in things that you cannot control. So code quality. Salsa does not tell you whether the developers writing the source code followed source secure coding practices. That is up to each software engineer, that is up to each you know, coder, software developer to actually uh, be in accordance with. It also does not assume or tell you producer trust. So it does not address organizations that intentionally produce any sort of malicious software, but it can reduce insider risks within an organization that you trust. So Salsa's build trust or build track protects against actually tampering during or after the build. So this is going to be your level two. Um, and future Salsa tracks intend to protect against any unauthorized modifications. So as we're kind of growing this, right now we're at level four, but as we're kind of growing this right now, it does not cover any sort of producer trust. And then any sort of transitive trust for dependencies. So the Salsa level, level of an artifact um, is independent of any of its dependencies, right? Many of these have their own ratings, many of these judged you know, based on an artificial artif artifacts dependencies on their own, but there's not a single level that actually applies to both the artifact and its transitive dependencies together. Um, and so uh, one other highlight here is that while automation of many of these tasks certainly help, um, it isn't practical for every software to, you know, consumer to actually vet the entire graft of every artifact. That will be almost nearly impossible. You can get as close as you possibly can to that, but, you know, doing, especially when you're at you're, you know, you're considering a larger organization with multiple streams of software being released at once, there's no way for you to actually automate all of those. So we're gonna do another question here and we're gonna switch over to multiple, multiple choice this time. So if you open up your phone again, um, the question is which of the following is the first step in the Salsa framework? So this is a trick question, um, and if everyone's good, I'll, I'll show you what the answer is. It is creating a bill of materials. So if you're actually considering what level one, uh, which is the first step of the Salsa framework is, right, that's where you're documenting everything. That's where you're creating this ingredient list of essentially all of the different things that you should be accounting for when you're going through all of the different um, areas of the supply chain and actually building that build process. So while building the software is very important, and that's kind of where every software engineer starts, uh, the important part of this question is what's the first step in the Salsa framework? So that is it. Um, the next question, it should show up, is why is the Salsa provenance step so important? Switch that over here.
So the right answer is to prevent the introduction of malicious software into the software supply chain. So the provenance essentially sets up all of the different requirements, right? It says, here's a documentation of what a normal build for, you know, look like. Um, and so while it does provide transparency and accountability for software development and deployment, the province is kind of the first step. You don't necessarily have to uh, have an authorized providence in the first step of the SALSA framework. Um, and so that's why A is correct or number one is correct. So what we'll do now is we'll kind of go through the different uh, levels of the actual framework. Um, and I'll show you, I'll give you a kind of a summary of where, what it is, um, what it could be intended for, what the requirements of it are, and then what the benefits of each level are. Just to give you an understanding of exactly, depending on where you kind of want to lie, what you need to be looking out for. So build level zero, this has no guarantees. This means that you know the framework cannot vouch for um, anything. You haven't really done or fulfilled any requirements, um, and it really, as a whole, uh, represents a complete lack of salsa. Um, but it is intended for you know, development or test builds of software that are built and run on the same machine and unit tests. Level one is a little bit more involved. And again, these are incremental. So level one, once you accomplish that and you go to level two, level two is going to include everything in level one as well as level two. Level three is gonna include everything in level two and onwards. So level one um, essentially defines or says that some sort of provenance exists. So packages uh, have provenance showing how it was built. And it can be used to prevent any mistakes but is trivial uh, to bypass or forge. So this is exactly that. It's just documentation exists about what the actual uh, you know, process for you as your organization looks like. It's intended for projects and organizations that are just very quickly wanting uh, to gain some benefits of salsa without really tampering into the production or protection and without really wanting to go in and change any of their build workflows. As you go more, you know, more on to level two and three and four, you're going to have to change certain build workflows to actually comply with the salsa framework. But level one just says, we know this exists, we just want the documentation to test against that and to have some sort of documentation that exists, but we, we're not at that place yet where we actually want to do any of that changing. Some of the requirements include, um, some of the requirements include, uh, you know, software producers actually following a consistent build process um, so that others can form expectations. Um, again, that providence exists and it actually describes how the artifact itself was built um, as, long as, you know, as well as the actual build platform, what the process looks like, and any of the top level inputs, so any of those important inputs that are going into the code themselves. Um, and then the software producer actually distributes this to the consumers. So these could be customers, these could be software developers, these could be you know anyone that actually determines any of the packages that enter that ecosystem. Um, but level one makes it easier for both the producers and consumers to actually go in, debug, patch, rebuild, and or analyze the software by knowing its precise source version and build process. If you're building through tools like Git, GitHub, things like that, right, it's very easy to um, use some of the open source code that's available on that and use that as, you know, build to actually build out your software. But many times if you don't have the document that's ready for all of the different components and dependencies that you're wanting to deploy as part of your build, um, it can add a lot of different uh, vulnerabilities that you might not be accounting for. With verification, uh, you know, you kind of also prevent on any mistakes that might be, uh, or that might exist during the actual release process. So, such as building from a commit that is not present in the upstream repo. So exactly kind of what I was mentioning with that GitHub example. Um, and then it aids organizations in creating an inventory of software and builds platforms used across a variety of teams. So this is very important because especially when you're building more and more sophisticated you know, software, you want to document everything that you build. We want to shift to this idea of a more security first type of mindset where that documentation exists so that engineers as they leave your organization or as new engineers come in or you have newer projects that come in, at least the process itself is going to be documented so that you can kind of build on top of that instead of coming up with random multiple streams of ways to, to build different streams. So then we move on to level two. 
Now level two is going to assume that it's gonna be built on a hosted build platform. So here you're actually forging the provenance. provenance. Um, before it was just provenance, it wasn't signed. Level does not. Level one does not actually have a complete quote unquote provenance. It just says we've produced it and here it is, it exists. Level two now goes in and says, okay, we're gonna authorize it. We're gonna make sure that if anything changes, it's signed. So we will know that you know it has been tampered with or it has changed. Uh, but we're gonna forge that provenance and evade any verification that will require an explicit attack. Um, and so this could be really easy. It's gonna deter any um, unsophisticated adversaries. Um, and it just means that you know the build now runs on a hosted platform that generates those signs of provenance. Um, it is intended to it is intended for those projects and organizations that want kind of a moderate um, security benefit from Salsa. So that means you have the documentation, you've done it, but you're also willing to actually do a couple of changes to the build platform itself that might be required by level two. Um, the actual requirements to, uh, to get to level two include building a platform or using the build platform that runs on dedicated infrastructure instead of an individual workstation. This is very important because this dedicated infrastructure is going to comply by you know, organizational policies and things like that. Um, and the provenance itself is going to be tied to that infrastructure through a digital signature. And that's kind of the key differentiation between level one and level two, that now you are um, going to be able to attest whether... Um, you know, your provenance has changed because of that digital signature. That downstream verification is going to include validating the authenticity of provenance. So you can go back towards the end of the, the entire supply chain after all of the builds have been kind of pushed through and go back and test to see that that provenance has, whether that provenance has, has file has changed or not. Um, and that's kind of going to be the b big key indicator for level two. So to actually get uh, the benefits from level two, uh, some of which include you know, everything you get from build one, but it also um, is going to highlight any sort of tampering that might happen um, after the actual build goes through. So that's the big key differentiator for level two. Um, it also deters adversaries, adversaries who might face legal or financial risk. Uh, it reduces the attack surface considerably because you're now limiting builds to specific build platforms. And then it allows for that large scale migration of teams uh, to actually support build platforms that are early um, while further hardening work, uh, which actually happens in level three. So level three is gonna focus more on hardened builds. Um, and the this is, you know, intended for most of the software releases. So this usually requires significant changes. Um, and if you have the resources to actually make those existing, you know, those changes to existing build platforms, this is kind of where you will probably end up at. But in a nutshell, you're forging the provenance or evading verification. Um, and this is gonna require exploiting vulnerabilities that is beyond the capabilities of most adversaries. So in practice, this means that you know, these builds are just going to run on a hardened platform um, and provide you that really strong tamper protection um, through a series of those checks. The requirements are going to include everything that was included in build two, um, along with the different controls, uh, such as you know, preventing any running from influencing one another, even with the same project, or preventing secret material being, from being used to sign the provenance, or from being accessed to the user-defined build steps. Um, and this is just going to do before, after, and then you know, during the actual um, build by any sort of insider threats. So you're looking at com compromised credentials, you're looking at making sure that you know, between tenants nothing is going to be um, kind of tampered with, um, and things like that. And then the last piece, which is probably the most important, um, is doing a two-person code review. So overall, Salsa 4, framework level four, will give you, um, the consumer, a very high degree of confidence this, that the software has not been tampered with. The requirements to actually get to this level is everything from Salsa 1, 2, 3, um, and then this. Uh, and this will you know, create that providence file. It will say you've created it, now we can actually have a person go through and do all of that code analysis, do that comparison of what was supposed to be created and then what was actually created once the test went on. Um, and so that's kind of what the hermetic build is referencing to. You have all of these you know, parameter lists, you have all of these uh, build processes that already exist and that you've documented and said, you know, this is what it should look like, this is what all of our software engineers would want to get at, um, and this is what the actual output was when we had this 
third party person um, audit this and actually come up with this result. So many companies do this in house. You know, many organizations say we want to actually go in and have a team that's dedicated to just building this out so that that one team is going to be in charge of kind of managing that uniformity, managing that consistency. Um, and other people have other companies that come in and do that audit for them. So this, these companies will have kind of that experience working across different organizations um, to actually be able to highlight, you know, whether um, that framework has been reached. But here, uh, the provenance documentation is going to capture everything, um, and then any sort of common security access and super user requirements will also be documented and will also be checked as, a, as we go through the software. Um, a two-person review is an industry best practice for catching mistakes and deterring bad behavior. And then hermetic builds also guarantee that the provenance list of depend dependencies is actually complete. So this really focuses and highlights reproducible builds. Um, although it's not strictly required, it does provide a lot of benefits because uh, if, it, if your software can say and do what it, you say it can, then you know, you know nothing has been tampered with, nothing has been changed. And so if we look back at um, that original attack vector uh, supply chain, and we talked a little bit about the different areas here where you know, things kind of went wrong, um, how would the Salsa framework have, have helped if you know, organizations actually followed it through? So if for you know, part A, where you actually submitted the bad code, um, if a researcher attempted to intentionally introduce vulnerabilities into the Linux kernel via patches, uh, a two-person review would have actually caught most, but not all of the vulnerabilities. So actually achieving Salsa Framework 4 would have gotten rid of the vulnerability that existed in part A. Um, for part B, if an attacker compromised PHP's self-hosted Git server and injected malicious commits, a better protected source code platform would have been a much harder target for the attackers to actually flow through and see. Um, for number C, or for letter C, if an attacker modified the build infrastructure to use source files not matching source control, a Salsa compliant build server would have actually produced providence identifying the actual sources used, allowing consumers to detect such tampering. So even before that was actually built out, they would have been able to catch that much faster. For D, and this is where SolarPrints happened, um, uh, an attacker compromised the build platform and installed an implant that injected malicious behavior during each build. Um, higher Salsa levels would have required stronger security controls for the build platform, make it, making it more difficult to compromise and gain persistence. So we would have caught that much faster on even before it was implemented to any other software, even if, before it was actually downloaded and it went through. Uh, for E, um, actually compromising package repositories or using bad dependencies, um, attackers adding an innocuous dependency and then updating the dependencies for more malicious behavior. If you had applied this also recursively to any of the dependencies that you had then included in that supply chain, this, is, this would have completely you know, reduced that vector um, and uh, the providence would have indicated that either this was not the build that we had used from you know, the starting point all the way through. And so we would have caught that much faster um, on because we would have known that it wasn't coming from GitHub. Uh, for CodeCov, so the, where the attacker used elite credentials to upload a malicious artifact to a GCS bucket, the providence of the artifact in the actual bucket would have shown that the artifact was not built in the expected manner from the expected source rep, uh, repository. And so that compromised package repository would have indicated, you know, this is not exactly anything that we had uh, or that was in our list, um, and we, would, we could have stopped right there. And then the last one was actually tricking consumers into using a bad package. So Salsa does not directly actually address this threat. We don't you know, deal with user behavior, but provenance linking back to the source control uh, could and enhance other solutions. So at some point in the entire supply chain, we would have figured it out even before it actually got to the use. And that's kind of what the target of doing much of the Salsa framework is, that you keep users out of it. You try to figure it out before it even gets to that user. You try to build those, you know, kind of assess those artifacts and do that attestation before it gets to that, that area. So next question. which level is intended for most software releases and usually requires significant changes to existing build platforms? Oh. All right, so 
question was, which level is intended for most software releases and usually requires significant changes to existing build platforms? So it was level three. Um, level four is going to require you know, complete um, rework. Uh, most of the time it's, it's pretty massive, but for level three, this is where most people end up uh, kind of coming to because it requires a sufficient amount where you can kind of vouch for the integrity of the entire supply chain without having to completely rework your entire chain. So level three is the answer here. And I think, yeah, the majority of you guys got it. All right, so we'll go into a couple of code examples. Um, much of this is actually released on GitHub today. So if you wanted to use any of the salsa verifiers or create pro provenance, which is that first step, you could uh, actually go to this GitHub link that we have here um, and build that provenance and kind of see what that documentation looks like. And there's you know, a variety of different ways to actually do this. You don't have to use it. You don't have to use uh, GitHub Actions, which is that primary tool to build it out. Um, you could, most cloud providers also have some sort of CI CD pipeline where you can use to build. Um, so we'll kind of show you what that looks like. So this is kind of what a provenance file will look like. And you'll see here, you know, this, um, this will be kind of your step for step one when you are building this out. It's gonna be a reusable workflow that you know, this Providence file is going to just create that generic workflow for you. There's multiple parts to it. So there's a parameter, and I'm not sure if you're, you can kind of see it from here, but there's an ID which will tell you exactly where this was built from. So as long as it's like a reputable source, whether it's from you know, Google Cloud Build or whether it's from GitHub, um, that will be indicated first. Um, and then it will actually tell you what you're building. So I'll walk you through the different aspects of these files. So here at the top, you have the actual type, and this is the classification or categorization of the ar artifact that you have. So in a normal provenance file, you'll have multiple areas and multiple artifacts that are represented that it will actually tell you more information about. But that top area is gonna be for the actual artifact that you're looking at and that you're assessing and attesting against. The second part is the name. So this is the actual name of the artifact, and it's the human readable identifier for the artifact that can be descriptive, that you can name, uh, whatever it is. Uh, the digest is the actual compact representation of everything that's within that artifact. So that's what's actually tested. It's a cryptographic hash that represents all of the data within that artifact. That's what we're gonna be looking at, that's what we're gonna be attesting against when we do that run and we actually sign the signature and we're you know, recreating that through a hermetic build. And the last piece is exactly where um, you know, this provenance file was built from. So this is the unique identifier for the provenance and for the artifact itself. You can see here this was actually created from GitHub ac Actions. So uh, depending on where you actually build this from, um, that will be represented below. And so just to kind of show you where that might change, this one is built from GitHub, but you can see here, right, if we were to use Cloud Build, which is Google's version of, um, you know, just building these files, that will change here. All right. So I think there's another question in here. So once you actually have the uh, salsa, the provenance file actually created, how do you verify that provenance that might be generated through GitHub? So again, if you wanted to go test this today, you could actually um, just go on GitHub. There's an entire repository that's dedicated for these tools, and it will walk you through exactly how to build these files, how to run it across any sort of build code that you've already created to test for some of the frameworks that we've talked about today. But um, these are the repositories. So this Salsa Verifier is kind of the tool you'll be looking at. And it is open source. It's a com companion project of the actual larger Salsa framework project. And so it is a file that's gonna have pretty much everything that you need when you're building it out. Um, but it also supports all of the major you know, CI platforms. So whether you're using GitHub, whether you're using Google Cloud Build or GitLab or any of the other tools, you can actually use Salsa Verifier to, to test and attest against those the builds that you, you grab from these. Um, it also supports all of the common artifacts. So across that supply chain, all of the different art artifacts that you are supporting, whether they're packages, whether they're binaries, containers, um, all of those can actually be run through this verifier um, and be tested against. And then you know it kind of accounts for 
uh, all of the GitHub workflows, the different API integrations and automation. So it's pretty open source. It's pretty you know, usable across different platforms as well. Um, but that leads to the source, which is what does the actual ver verification of this. So the source tags will uh, do um, and link to all of the metadata that that links the sort of software artifact to its actual source code. So when you're actually comparing your uh, repository against all of the different source code against that framework, it will then come up with you know a level that says, okay, you you've achieved level one, level two, level three. Um, but this can kind of be done through the salsa verifier here. And so with that, um, what we're actually going to show you some of this in action. So um, kind of what the verification looks like and, and that, just so you're not looking at code. Well, they'll be looking at more code. <laughs> but in action. I don't, I don't need the, I don't need the power, it's fine. How's it going? Hopefully, uh, Zara has shared enough. Um, but while this is setting up, um, how many people think that, um, knowing the audience here, uh, we are running in a very safe environment from an application pers perspective in production? Yeah. So um, in Google, we actually, you know, everybody, hopefully everybody in here uses some type of Google, Google products from Google Maps to meet. So um, it'll be, I, I thought it would be kind of interesting to talk about what supply chain looks like because um, for the security folks in the room, obviously looking at the Salsa Level 4 pipeline, you probably want to faint knowing what you have today because it would involve six months to a year to release anything into production. Well, probably six months to a year is what's happening today. Um, however, um, what we do want to introduce um, are just mechanisms to think about how code can be secured and then put automation in play so that a lot of these things could be automatic, right? Um, and the whole goal with all the industry where even where DOD is going is that we will be pushing more capabilities from a software perspective into production than ever before. Uh, gone are or fading are the days where you write the code once, put it in a black box, drop it to the edge, and expect to get it in five, five, ten years because software is running faster than ever. So I think this is a little bit safe information to release. We are pretty secret about how we are releasing code today, but this is 2015, and at Google scale, um, feel free to take a picture because this is probably safe now. We're almost ten years. Um, but this is, this is what it looks like, right? So without any kind of automation, if you think about from a Google um, perspective, um, we would, if we scale linearly with uh, release engineers, security engineers, that is not maintainable from an organization in Google in 2015. So we had to find out a lot of ways to automate a lot of these processes um, and procedures so that these things can be easy or um, almost invisible to the developers as they're pushing code. So the idea here is have these mechanisms by default, behind the walls, people don't see it, there's almost no delay, but things are happening to provide enough feedback so that folks understand these things are happening. So this is what it looks like. Um, and uh, anybody in this room think DOD's at salsa level one, two, salsa level two maybe, three, three? Definitely a hard no. Okay. Well, today we're going to look at an environment that's salsa level three, so not um, two people reviewing code, um, but however, um, a, 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 a platform where we are using um, a bunch of open source tools. Uh, Snake. Anybody uses Snake in in this room? So it's um, Snake is a vulnerability scanner. It looks at all your code to say, hey, um, does your code import any libraries that's good or bad, and what are the major vulnerabilities that's introduced as a result of that. And then um, another component we'll be using that's not Google is uh, SonarCube. Folks use SonarCube in this room? So SonarCube looks at um, how good the code is actually written. Um, so you can put a gate on test coverage. You can put a gate on um, redundant code, how well a certain code. So if you think about it as your English teacher or somebody, Think about it from an English teacher perspective, grading everybody's essay, right? And your essay is code. You're kind of looking at it from the perspective of 
is this a good piece of paper or it's just a lot of useless words so that I can get the word count up to meet whatever the minimum requirement is, right? So these are some of the things we think about. And then finally, it's not a Google conversation without talk about Gen AI. So I got a giggle out of this tweet, <clears throat> or X, I don't know what it's called now, but it's uh, the hottest new programming language is English because with all the Gen AI and the large language model conversation, we see more and more so that folks are using things like Kodi uh, or ChatGPT to write applications and then even verify to write, write test coverages. So a challenge to the room, if we keep it interactive, is how many people think ChatGPT will write better code than a developer or safer code than a developer? None, right? And that's accurate because it doesn't know. It doesn't know what code it's getting from. So there are ways to train it. But generally, um, I don't think the technology is quite there yet to trust a large language model to um, write code and produce code that is 100% safe. Likely we'll get there faster um, with large language model, but today being fairly new to the space, it's not quite there. However, LLM does um, in in introduce an interesting perspective on how um, the review, um, so for uh, salsa level four, it's human review with another set of eyes, right? But it, it can kind of introduce efficiencies so that these things can be maybe simpler um, at the end because like me as a developer in my past life, I, I don't want to look through 2,000 lines of somebody else's code and make sense of it. I know, but that's a lot of code. <laughs> All right, um, so this is the environment today. This environment today, I know it's, it's, a, it's an eye chart, um, but this is a DOD conference show. Folks are used to eye charts. Um, this is what it looks like. Um, what, what I want to emphasize is developer at the end of the day is, uh, let me put on the laser pointer, is here. They're using an IDE to check in code. And then we have a platform that automates the deployment, the scanning of the code, uh, the validation of uh, the quality of the code, and then push it into a deployment CICD pipeline so that code can be um, promoted into various environments. And the idea for that is when developer writes code, especially um, in today's microservice development cycle, we want these changes to be integrated into a QA or dev environment as quickly as possible so we don't break anybody else's builds. And then finally, um, at the runtime environment, this is a containerized uh, deployment today. It doesn't have to be. A lot of the workload today is on, still on virtual machines. Um, but the benefit to that is even in virtual machine world, you can use uh, you can use Terraform, Ansible. There are a lot of tools out there to help the release um, of your code. The, the entire objective there is um, how do you standardize it? How do you have uh, a standardized API so that I can push code and, and for it to share and for others to see as quickly as possible? So this will be a video. Like gen we, we try to do this last year. I don't know what, if folks are here last year. I believe. Some people in the room were here last year where we try to have everybody do the, through this coding exercise, and it was not as fun as I anticipated. So this year will be a video, um, and I'll walk through what's happening, but feel free to pause and ask questions. So what you see here is um, essentially, um, I'll, I'll pause here. This is a cloud build, um, but it's uh, if you think about it as a manifest that describes what my software release chain looks like. The reason why we want to manifest is because we want it to be reproducible from security engineer to release engineer. Everybody understand the steps along the way. So at the very top, you see that I'm using something called a snake scan. So a snake scan um, is able to look at your source repo to say you are importing all these libraries that introduces vulnerabilities. Do you want to approve or deny, right? So it gives you a score on what it understands almost like, I hate to use the term, uh, McAfee, <laughs> but almost like a virus scan for your Windows operating system at the end of the day that tells you what things are vulnerable from a source level perspective. And then Sonar Cube is your English teacher kind of grading your source code to say if it's good or not. You can um, use the default setting to say test coverage is 80%. I think that's the default setting. But you can do other gates um, so that your test, uh, your test coverage or your um, dependencies, how environment variables are set, these things are 
set at a higher level so that um, folks can approve or deny um, a, a set of code that's being committed to source. And that's what this looks like. Um, and from the cloud build perspective, what I'm saying here is I want you to run uh, Snake uh, first and foremost. And then once you have run, completed that step in my CI CD pipeline, and then run the sonar cube um, to give me a score. And then finally, in the sonar cube piece, I say, hey, um, if it, uh, I, I will wait, but it, if, um, if, if the auto fail, if the sonar cube is not, uh, if kind of fails the build, right? It does not clear the gate. And then this is the, the, the building of the container itself. Um, what's important here, um, if you look at here, is something called image digest. Oh. What's important here is this image digest line that's being highlighted. Im image digest, it's almost like a signature file for your build. So if you think about what Zara talked about is how do I know this piece of code has been scanned and I can actually release it in production? We will hash the digest to say this digest goes with container image and this is almost like the, the bomb, the bill of materials for this application that I wanna push through and I will have a system that verifies that signature every single time. And so the rest are the building steps. Uh, uh, we have something um, in Google Cloud called binary authorization. So it's a, it's, a, it's a manual procedure to say, me as an application owner, do I want to approve this piece of application for release into my QA or dev or if I wanna promote it, right? So in this example, it's a manual step, but in many instances, it's an automated step. So after I run the pipeline, what you see back here, um, it takes about six minutes to build the image, but a build is happening in the upper left corner. That's why you have the wheel spinning. And this is the sonar cube um, that kind of grades uh, my overall project to say, how good is my code? This is a simple Node.js application. So I, there's, there's, not, there's not anything fancy in there. But um, if I were to kind of introduce a lot of functions with a lot of redundancy, it's gonna call it out, it's gonna, it's gonna fail my overall code quality. And here, I wanna show you the gate, this is the default gate, um, um, and this is where you can start uh, putting in mechanisms to say whether or not, as an enterprise and, or as an organization, I want to approve or try to standardize all the code that's coming in from various contractors or FSIs to make sure they're of the same quality, because as a FSI in my pre previous life, you look at, you know, we like to make fun of other FSIs that's not of the same umbrella and company, right? But how, how do you make sure, more importantly, from an enterprise perspective, that there's a standardized coding quality across the board? So um, this is where I'm kind of introducing my own gates um, to say these, these are the new gates I want to add and I want to define this for the salsa demo and what I changed over here for my own um, gates are just uh, a higher set of uh, code coverage and a higher set of um, redundancy check to make sure that when these thresholds are not hit, then fail it, right? The, the default gate is pretty easy, um, but you can, you can do a lot of definitions here to um, have a different set. So on the left hand, you'll see that is actually snake scanning all the all the libraries being imported and tell you the vulnerabilities. So what we have in this environment, we're actually not gonna fail anything off of the snake scan, right? Even though snake is generating an artifact off of your source code to say, I've discovered, I think before it was like 12 vulnerabilities, something like that. Um, however, for this environment, what I'm saying is, I want to manually release the code. There are more, in, more, more automation you can put in play because snake does produce something called, it's a JSON payload, I forgot exactly what the name is, but it's a JSON payload that you can look at against your source code to say how many vulnerabilities are critical, medium, or low associated with the, this piece of code I want to release, and it's very easy to put that JSON payload into a parser to say whether or not I want to automate um, the, the deployment of this application to my development environment automatically, right? So, because this is a manual gate today, for the purpose of this demo, it's, it's easier to show. <clears throat> Here, I'm just adding my own gates um, because the first build, I wanna show you how everything is passing through. So you, if you look at here, um, 
Oh. If I can go back. Oh, shoot. Now I've done it. Apologies. Yeah, this is the sneak scan. Yeah, so on the left-hand side screen, you see uh, like about five, five steps, right? That's my actual build process. So what, what I'm saying is um, in my CI-CD pipeline, I said if you don't, um, for snake, it's automatically passed. But for the sonar cube, if you don't pass the step, do not run, do not even bother to run the rest of the steps. Um, the reason why that's necessary, if you think about a large organization running microservices, you will have resource constraints um, where folks are queuing up in the release pipeline to say my code needs to be released into QA or development um, so that others can see it. And then that queue gets longer and longer if your ability to produce code um, is, it takes a long time, right? So if you think about your typical software release cycle that six, takes six months, um, then what, what, what it means from, a de from other developers that's writing code that's dependent on that library is that they're waiting that long before they can actually understand if their code works or not. So the idea there for these uh, builds is to be as most efficient as possible. If a build fails at step two, let's just kick it out so that they get feedback right away as opposed to waiting out for the actual deployment step to fail something. So what I'm doing here is, um, because this is tied to a CCI CD pipeline, um, if we make the smallest commit into my source tree repository, I'm just changing the readme file right here. Um, but when, once I push a change into this uh, repo, um, it will trigger a build event automatically. So I don't know if your organization's doing that, but the idea there is, instead of saying somebody saying, hey, I'm ready to push a code, and then go walk down like whatever hallway to say I'm ready to release code for all these people um, to, to action off of. As soon as code is committed, I want to trigger a build and that piece of code should be released into our QA environment for integration testing. So what's happening is I've upgraded my gates, I've changed my gates uh, to a higher standard. And as you can see, um, those uh, five steps that's shown uh, to, the, to the left are failing at the sonar cube. So on the sonar cube, I asked for higher code coverage and higher, uh, higher uh, lower code redundancy for my actual source code. And this is all to show you that, you know, uh, why you want to make these builds and provide uh, developer feedback as quickly as possible. Right here, I'm committing another change. Um, and this change should trigger another build. And that build is happening in the background. And I just want to show you, once I made the changes, uh, it is able to uh, pass through the build process. Now I actually updated my code to meet those standards. So the idea there is I want to have uh, a lot of automation in play, but I want to give developers or developers like or developing companies as much um, feedback as quickly as possible um, so that they, they understand what is going on in my environment. So this is actually where I approve the build. So as the application owner, so application owner is a concept in Google where um, we don't have an O&M shop once application is built. Um, the operations and maintenance shop is actually the product team itself. So if you think about a Gmail team or a workspace team, they're the ones that are on pager duty. Um, the reason for that is we want those developers to be more empathetic um, on how, how code and features are released. And also, um, you people tend to write better code when they are on pager duty, <laughs> when for things when things break. Um, so what's happening as an application owner, um, I'm looking at um, all the, all the um, reports I'm getting back from um, various mechanisms to say whether or not I want to release this, this piece of code. Um, as I mentioned before, these are the vulnerabilities. Um, so if you think about your AO or your security engineer, um, you have to understand what Snake is telling you for all these vulnerabilities, maybe tie to CVEs and say, I am okay with this risk and I'll accept it and I will manually say, approve this release. And what's happening in the background is where we are running this on Kubernetes and Kubernetes has a bunch of features in there that allows you to um, have binary authorization. 
So remember that um, the key, the signature file I kind of mentioned before where the container is signed and the manifest from the sonar scan from the snake scan is also signed. What binary authorization will do is put everything into a, ball, um, a bomb to say, this is everything that is associated with my application release. And once all the artifacts are verified, then Kubernetes as a container orchestration engine will approve the release of the code onto the, onto the nodes itself, right? So binary authorization is turned on so that you don't have any kind of nefarious user to say, I want to push something like a daemon set or I want to push another pod uh, manually by bypassing the CI/CD pipeline. We want to have the kubectl CLI available. Um, however, we want the cluster be self-aware of its security posture so that it rejects code that has not been approved. So this is one of these clusters. And this is what it looks like once it's done. Um, I will fast forward to see what it looks like when I'm trying to deploy code manually. Uh, give me a second. So here I'm just fetching uh, my um, Kubernetes permissions with a gcloud command, but it's and the rest of the commands I'm gonna run with kubectl. Um, so here I'm gonna do a simple run, a kubectl run command. So essentially what I'm saying is take a container, any con container in this instance, I'm running nginx, and I say push it in my cluster, cluster you release it. What's interesting here with uh, these platforms at Salsa level three, what we'll see if you um, can see the little notes um, under here, it says cannot deploy this container essentially. It's, it's saying by policy, your container, your request to run this container has been rejected. Because uh, me, I cannot, as a cluster, I have a security policy in play where I will not accept anything, I will not deploy anything that has not been signed, does not have a proper digest. So what you'll see in the next command um, is that um, I take the manifest from my um, previous build, which, contain, which uh, contains a container image, which image I want to deploy, also the digest, the, the SHA-256 digest for that container image. Um, you'll see it here, I'll pause. So it says image um, policy uh, is denied. Uh, the, this, so this, this one's still denied. And then I will deploy something with, uh, so I'm gonna copy the digest from that image file and, ah, uh, So here, um, it says image uh, gcr.io, that's our container registry. So if you think about it as your Docker hub, any harbor, whatever container registry, it does not matter. Uh, what's important here is um, at the end of my container image, if you notice this long string starts with a F0 something, that is the signature for um, that I'm looking for. What's, what's gonna happen from uh, the Kubernetes cluster perspective, it's gonna go verify dash signature against all the artifacts that it understands it can deploy and will give you a thumbs up or thumbs down on whether or not it can handle that piece of workload and release it to environment, right? So this is there to say we want to authenticate, uh, we want to have high confidence of the um, authenticity when somebody's trying to release code outside of a CD, CI CD pipeline because one paradigm I run into a lot um, as a developer is Everything has to be a CI CD pipeline and it does not give me any leeway to tweak something, especially for the lower environments. So I want to have that flexibility as well if I just want to run a quick cuddle command. And that's what it looks like. So if you look at that, the pod was created. I was able to deploy successfully uh, into this environment. Um, and that's it. So this, from a developer perspective, they don't really feel the pain, right? Everything's under the hood, but we are just to summarize, we're running snake scan, we're running sonar cube, we're running binary authorization. So all these things are happening in the background. And from a developer perspective, it's all invisible, but we are at Salsa level three. So security folks that are concerned about manually doing this, um, if you have the proper platform in place, don't be so concerned because it should be automated. That concludes my demo. Um, we do have a repo, so for, for the folks that are interested, um, this entire demo is checked into GitHub as well, so if you wanna ping uh, myself or Zara, I'll be happy to share the link for this repo so you can try to reproduce this on your own.
<laughs> All right, any questions? Yes, sir. Um, I think other parts are. Um, for Zara and I, um, we are um, not very, very closely tied to the White House. There's so many engineers in Google um, yeah. at the end of the day. So we are probably aware, but not, not the tip of the spear for that conversation. So this Google engineer, right, um, social framework was open sourced by Google, so you may take it as uh, somewhat biased, but I think the four levels that you see with level zero being no attestation whatsoever, all the way to four, from a principal perspective, there are many products in the industry that can fit that scenario. Um, it will be great um, for this to be the standard, because at, I think at the end of the day, we, we need to have something from events like um, SolarWinds, like Aurora within Google, where some malicious code was ingested along the, injected along the way. And um, the things that we, we trust most from the security perspective are the, the scanners, uh, all those agents that's sitting around thinking that they're never gonna be attacked. And those things actually have service accounts that have access to anything and everything. So those actually are the most vulnerable. So I would say, Yes, um, that's what we're pushing for, and uh, hopefully this is, uh, makes a change from with Zara and I being here, but we are pushing for government to understand how software should be controlled and why it's a threat generally um, overall. Yeah, and if I could just add, so the framework itself gives you a checklist, right? So your endpoint is actually understanding if your software is secure. Right, if it was built the way that you said it was. So the software it's, or the framework itself will give you the steps that you need to go through and kind of like what Ming was demonstrating in his demo and then you know, kind of what we were talking about. The, the, the way to get there, you can use any combination of tools. We've kind of shown you the different tools that you know, Google has having created this process, having kind of expertise in this area, but um, all of that like to use and to get to that point, all you necessarily have to do is just follow like the entire framework to to be able to attest to that level, so. Yeah, I mean, I, I think from somebody that works in DOD space, I think there's a lot of code out there with probably men in the middle and listeners that we're just not aware of, and that's a scary thought. All right, any more questions? Right. So what does that, I know you covered it, but what does that Yeah, um, think about it as a signature. So every application I produce, even if I change one character, whether it be space, period, tab, whatever, in a piece of code, it would change um, the overall payload, uh, your bill of materials. So 
Um, binary authorization are two things. One is the ability to understand that digest, so I can see what I release into production is truly what it validates. It's gonna, it's gonna take the application and hash it again, right, to see if the signatures match. So it's almost like in DOD terms when you sign your email and then you encrypt it, it's kind of putting the private, it's using your PKI pair to do that. So it's essentially doing, doing that from a software perspective. So everything that's released has that signature and verifiable and to the gentleman's other question, traceable to its provenance, how it's being produced. So that's, that's, the, that's the capability we're trying to introduce. It's, it's there in many containerized platforms today. I would say probably DOD is not leveraging it to its full extent. And, and what level of salsa would that be at? Salsa level three for the binary authorization. But don't see it as, I would say don't see it as like I must get to one, then two, then three. I think getting off of zero is a great start. start yeah. <laughs> and if you want to tackle platform first, okay, right? Um, because it's not, it's not mutually exclusive if you, if you don't start at step one. Step one has like a lot of good features. It's all of it are just open, open source framework on some of the things that people should care about. So another thing we're doing Google, um, speaking about um, open source libraries, is that if I release code today in 2023, November, how do I know that a vulnerability is not gonna be discovered in the future? So um, in Google, there's actually a further uh, capability to continuously scan code that is running in production to say, these are newly discovered set of vulnerabilities on libraries that I've, I've used, and how do I identify those so those applications can be prioritized for patching or even disabling um, is a feature we're thinking about. So for us, it's looped in the overall salsa framework that's running internally, but um, there are customers that's using that curated repo uh, for what they can import and use um, when developers are writing code. Yeah. And a lot of these, these tools are open source. Yep. So, you know, you can, like, if you're interested in just, like, testing them out, you can go on the GitHub repository and actually test them out. So. So we, I didn't think we were going to do it, but I think we used the full time, and we're very, try to be respectful of everybody's time. So um, who's the winner?